change is coming. Change on the farms, in the fields, in markets too. And yes, in your kitchen. Change is coming. That's up next on Chefs of Field. Want to find out who serves the best food, tastiest, healthiest, the freshest? Rise early and poke around the market near you. The chefs who care the most will be found talking with the people who grow the vegetables and feed the chickens. From Boston, from Portland, from Atlanta, come the chefs who are connected to the farmers, the chefs in the fields. The success of Chef Stan Frankenthaler has for many years now depended on his connection with farmers. Frankenthaler's restaurant is Salamander in Boston. One of the farmers he's known the longest is Jim Ward. For generation, the Wards have farmed in harmony with nature. I always like visiting the farms and visiting with the farmers, and the Wards are really a wonderful family. They've been carrying their mission for quite a while, and uh, they're really bound by a lot of tradition, and, and I think that that produces some of the best food. Jim's a great grower, and he really inspires his guys there on the farm to care for the vegetables and the fruits that they grow. So, Jim, you have um, several varieties of squashes mixed in each row? Yeah, in, in this row we have patty pan squash, and mm -hmm. we grow kusa squash. Kusas. We should pick some of those, too. Sure. I think one of the things that, um, you know, is really um, a part of uh, uh, sh working with chefs and chefs working with farmers is um, you have to love all of the varieties, you know, you have to take them all, use them all, cook with them all and find what, you know, really makes each one taste best. I mean, they just taste so great on their own and these are so beautiful. This is uh, fun for me to grow. Summer squash and zucchini are sort of a dime a dozen, but I like growing patty pan and that's why I like to sell the chefs. Uh, we get to grow some cooler varieties and uh, yeah. Some of them are trickier to grow, but they uh, they taste better, and we get passionate people that are really excited about it, and uh, I bet you can do something fun with that. I like the taste of the patty pans, too, and they look so nice. They're fun, too. I mean, you know, you can slice them this way, and they look really nice, and you can grill them, or you can cut them into little wedges along where kind of they naturally sort of scallop on the edges here, and they look great. That's a great tasting squash. And we can pick some other colors, too. We grow a green version of that. We yeah, grow, let's uh, mix them up. Some kusa, yeah, we can grow a few. We'll, we'll harvest a few. Let's see what we've got in here. <laughs> Here's some of the green. Yeah, um, I thought the green was more the traditional or the older color. And it's the one I prefer to eat, too, is the green. What I like to do is I like to roast them a little bit to make them a little bit more tender and a little bit more flavorful as we get dinner started. And then we'll finish them really quickly in a saute pan um, either with a little bit of sesame oil, uh, which goes really nice, I think, with the squashes. Toast a little garlic and, and a little ginger, just kind of caramelize that a little bit and uh, have the roast the squash whole and then slice it. And it keeps a lot of its flavor and it's nice and moist, but uh, comes out tender on the plate that way. Nice. So my wife grills it. She cuts it in half, a little olive oil and, uh, on the grill. Not cooked too much, it's the way I like it, and uh, just barely. You know, yeah, a, a so it has a little grill, bit of a little bit of a little bit of firmness still, and uh, it's got a really good sweetness. And I like the smaller size too, Jim. I, I I think the sweetness is really there in the smaller size. The skin is nicer. This one merely kind of is that sort of that perfect size, yeah. right? Yeah, that's what these we small go for. ones look nice on the plate, but they don't fill up a box too fast. They don't fill up a box <laughs> very fast. Oh boy, it takes a long time to fill a bucket <laughs> with that. I'll tell you that. Well, it seems like that the chefs are a demanding lot, huh? <laughs> yes, yeah, passionate baby but everything. demanding. <laughs> I'm not always into no. baby everything. Buying from the local folks, you get fresher food, and knowing the people who grow the food that you cook with, you know what they're about, and they're very passionate people, and they're really taking care of those raw ingredients that come into the kitchen. It's keying off of their passions and their interests. There's just nothing like that. There's no other way of getting those kinds of ingredients to cook with than by 
having local folks bringing them to you. Mm. Yeah, it's spicy this time of year. It is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But it's a nice size. Being aware yeah. of what is in season, feeling, smelling, tasting, the importance of locally grown produce, free of contaminants, the real family farm close by the city market. Anne Quattrano is the owner and chef at Atlanta's Bacchanalia. She has been so committed to the connection between chef and producers that she added this store, Star Provisions, to celebrate food specialties prepared individually, breads, cheeses. Hey, Joanne. Hey, Anne, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing a dish today, I need a cheese. Okay. And I wanted your advice. It's a carrot salad made with baby organic carrots, and they have a little bit of cumin and coriander in them, and some sultanas, so it's kind of sweet and aromatic. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I need a cheese that's kind of nutty to counteract that, and definitely not sweet. Well, I've got these three cheeses already out. Let's take a look at these. Um, the first one here is from Thomasville, Georgia. It's sweetgrass dairy, and that's um, Desiree Winger. She's the one who brings the cheeses in the cooler for us uh, right. a couple times a week. It's fresh, very fresh. It is very fresh, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking that maybe you need something with a little more age. Mm -hmm. um, well, we could try it. I think it, the sharpness is good of the goat's milk. I think mm -hmm. that the acidity will work well, but I think that it might not have enough complexity to finish out the dish. So let's try it and keep going. Okay. okay? Well, let me cut you a little taste here. And that is, um, those are a trio of peppercorns on top, mm -hmm. pink, green, and black. Well, I can get rid of those. <laughs> mm. It's very good, very fresh. Mm -hmm. I think, um, let's, let's see about the cow's milk cheese, see what we think about that. That's aged a little longer. It is. This is the uh, Pleasant Ridge Reserve. It comes from Putney, Vermont. Try a little taste of this one. And how long is this aged? Mm, maybe about eight or nine months. Mm. It's nice. I think we should try the sheep's uh, just to be sure. Okay. This is a great cheese. It's handmade by Dr. Pat Elliott in Rapidan, Virginia. This cheese is very aged. Well, I think she goes for at least six months, but it looks like this went longer. I think it went longer because it's also spent some time in our aging facility mm -hmm. here. Mm. It's perfect. It's sharp. It's got some nutty qualities to it. Mm -hmm. I think the aging will really stand out in this, with the salad. I wash these carrots. I'm going to peel them lightly. They're really pretty. If I were eating these myself and not serving them, I probably wouldn't peel them at all. I think a scrub on the skin is enough. What I did was I have juiced a few carrots and I have their juice in the bowl that I've reduced with a little bit of maple syrup and lemon juice and also some toasted cumin seeds. I'm just gonna drizzle in olive oil and I don't even want to emulsify it. I just want a little oil in this um, juice of carrots. And I'm gonna just toss that lightly with our uh, finely sliced carrots. You could do this on a mandolin, but I'm just going to do them by hand. They're really, really tender. I'm just going to toss these very lightly in this vinaigrette. And they're completely raw, which is perfect. I'm going to drizzle a little bit of extra virgin olive oil on the plate. A little bit of white pepper. Sea salt. And we have this beautiful Everona cheese, and I'm just gonna take one shave off of it. Place it right on the side of the salad. And a little bit of fresh coriander. It's from another one of our organic growers. And that's our simple little carrot salad. We feel that food is best prepared simply, and for simply prepared vegetables, you need the freshest, best quality available, and that seems to only be available locally. Seattle is such an organic place. You know, we're surrounded by two mountain ranges, and there's 
all the desert fruit and product that comes from the eastern side and, and all the wet like berries, you know, huge raspberries, blackberries, blueberries. Chef Tom Douglas of Palace Kitchen in Seattle is in his local wine shop, a lesson in where it all comes from. Hey, Mike. Hey, Tom. How you doing? Good. What's going on? I'm coming in to show off the state of the Northwest. The state which is, and what is this? The state, the wine the state, state of, of North, Washington. The, the wine state of the Northwest, yeah. Uh, which is Washington, obviously, second biggest wine producing state in the That's country. That's correct. But a lot um, of people I, don't know that. I don't think they realize how many varieties we, of wine we make and how many wineries we have. That's yeah. definitely true. So I'd love to try one of my favorite varietals, I think, the, from the state of Washington uh, Chardonnay, fabulous Chardonnays, uh, Merlots. Uh, I know the Syrahs are really coming on in the state. Why is, why is the Syrah thing getting so big? People like the flavor of it. It's big, rich, ripe red wine that's right. relatively easy to drink when it's young. I think they're ready to try new things. You know, Washington's been known for Merlot for a long time, uh -huh. and people have tried a lot of Washington Merlots. So after a while, it's like in your restaurant, you eat one dish a few times, you're ready for something new. Right. I love cooking with Syrah. I mean, it has a real, it's got a real kind of country flavor that mm -hmm. uh, Cabernet doesn't have, for example. Right. Uh, so I think it's a great, yeah, yeah. there's a grapey, grapiness about it that uh, I think it's a great cooking wine. Mm -hmm. Love drinking Cabernet, love drinking Merlot, but I love cooking with Syrah. Mm -hmm. um, you want to try some Merlot? Sure. All right, let's go. let's go do it. What makes the Washington Merlot different from, say, a Northern California or, you know, Napa Valley Merlot? I'd say there's a lot of similarity, similarities between Washington and California, but I find that our grapes tend to have a little more acidity, a little mm -hmm. brighter flavors. Uh, Eastern Washington is uh, quite a bit farther north than California. We get up to, I think, two hours more daylight in the, in the heat of the summer. Uh -huh. uh, even though it gets quite warm over there, we get cool nights, so we get this combination of really ripe fruit, good balancing acidity that gives you a freshness of flavor that I think is unique. Now, what do you get out of this? What do you like out of that? Well, I think a hallmark of this winery is wine Chinook, is their smoothness. The so. winemaker, Case Simon, really aims for wines that are user-friendly, that have a softness. That she gives them more bottle age before she releases them. Yeah, at least a year, it seems Which is like big, longer. at least a year longer than the average winery. Right. So the wines have a softer character. Mm. Uh, they're not ponderous, they're not heavy, they're really well-balanced, they're really good food wines, as I think you've found out uh, when you right. used them at the restaurant. Another fabulous varietal up here is Chardonnay. Right. I, mean, I know we sell a ton of it at the restaurants. Um, Sauvignon Blanc, the Rieslings from the Northwest mm -hmm. were the very, first, the very first ones to get famous out of right. here, really. Was... Saint Michel Riesling, how many years ago? Mm -hmm. uh, huge. So this is Hogue. Again, this is another one. I tried, I tried to pick a couple of wines that mm -hmm. were available all over the country. Right. But the Hogue Chardonnay. Yeah. Hogue is still a fam is a family run winery. A typical Northwest Chardonnay, good color. Um, any, anything else that se separates it from? Yeah, I think Washington Chardonnays definitely stand apart, maybe even more than the reds from California wines. They're a, a bit more delicate. They're still rich and have a lot of oak, but they don't tend to have quite as much alcohol. Right, you don't get that hot feeling. And you get that fresher, fruitier uh -huh. flavor, uh, a little lighter on the palate. So I think, I mean, in many ways, they're better food wines. Um, you know, a big, high alcohol white tastes good by itself, but matching it up with food, it's a problem. But Hogue really pushes for, they call it fruit forward. Right. So they want you to taste the flavor of the grape. You get good acidity. So you get a nice bit of oak, but it, it's not the first thing you taste. You, uh -huh. Again, you taste the fruit, which I was, is the key. I was using some Chardonnay in my chowder, my muscle chowder that I was making, and mm -hmm. really, uh, when you go against the cream, it really just made yeah, a nice thing. Yeah, you need that acidity. And uh, yeah, and it added, you know, the oak adds a little bit of woodsy mm -hmm. flavor to it. And, right. Uh, I like it. It's just not overly hot and overly strong. Mm, delicious. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Always good to see you. Yeah, man. The hardneck garlic peels easier. It does not have as long a shelf life, and it's, it's, it's a stronger garlic. It's, Corey it's, Schreiber is the chef at Wildwood style. Restaurant in Portland, Oregon. He's out on the farm today with Jeff Bowden. In the decade or so that Jeff has been cultivating without contaminants, the land devoted to organic farming across North America has been growing by 20% each year. Wow, 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 wow. So here we have the elephant garlic. It's a good year this year. It's about as large as I've ever seen it before. <laughs> it's huge. I saw this in the market when you had it in your stall about uh, four weeks ago, and I just stopped in my tracks. <laughs> and, and my mind started racing real quick as to what, what to do with this. I mean, it's so, it's so impressive. It's just beautiful, healthy looking. We plant these out in the field in, uh, in September, and we harvest them in uh, about the 4th of July right here. So that mm -hmm. was about the 4th of July. Yeah, it was, it was just the first week. The first week of July. 
It's a uh, elephant garlic. When we plant one pound of seed, it be out basically five times as itself. So when the person's on my side trying to figure out how much that I can sell, I, I, it's a multiplication factor. This year is going to probably maybe a little bit better because it's, it's generally larger. You, know, you look at this and people get a little bit nervous almost because they think of garlic being so strong. But this, of course, is a little bit on the mild side. Yeah. And somebody mentioned, is it even in the same family? It's, a, it's in the allium. It's in the allium it's, family. Yep. It, uh, I take it and uh, I always intend to want to poach it first in a little bit of water. And I was using that actually at home the other night and I cooked it and it almost has a thickener in it. I noticed I cooked it down with a little bit of, uh, little bit of onion and some olive oil making a pasta sauce and it turned white and it was almost like adding starch to a pan. Huh. I don't know what that is, that it omits this thickener. But otherwise, I take it and then I roast it really slow in the oven with a little olive oil and some herbs and I make like a paste in a mortar and pestle and uh, put it on bread. And it's just, uh, it just turns heads when people eat it. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Yeah. That should last until, what, maybe? Yeah, Christmas time. Christmas time? Yeah, we usually say Christmas because uh, it, it, it tends to really decrease. When we get the humidity like we all get and our forced air furnaces turn on, you dehydrate it or you mold it, one of the two. So you're telling me that this has a natural preservative in it to it. I mean, it's yeah. gonna, it's gotta, the preservative is going to carry it all the way through. You don't add anything to it? <laughs> it just lasts. That's right. You got to make sure it's dry, though, right? Is that That's the key? correct. They're going out a little bit. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Preservation at its best right there. Okay. Beautiful. One of the best places to see and hear the connection, Farmer Chef, Chef Farmer, is right there in the open air market. There's a huge awareness that's arising in the markets when people are touching the food, feeling the food, talking directly to the farmer. Yeah, these are, they get nicer this time of the year because we have more light. Pascal, how are you? Good to Good see, to see you. you. You see these crabs? One chef, now two chefs. Chef Corey is joined by a friendly competitor, a buddy of many years, Chef Pascal Sauton of Lucerne in Portland. Just yesterday? You go by the pound or by the piece? By the pound. By the pound? Yeah. You're like, yeah. what are you, 500 pounds, 600 yeah, pounds? 500. Really? Right there, yeah. How has the season been? Has it been, been pretty abundant? Good. It's been yeah, pretty good. Right. It's been great. We went crabbing, you know, with the chef's collaboration. You went crabbing too? Yeah. Um, how many did you guys get? Three or four, maybe? Uh, <laughs> two each. <laughs> two each? Yeah. There's so much of it out there, you just keep getting it and getting it. Uh, Pierre does only Saturday. On Saturday morning? Yeah. So yeah. you come down, what did you tell me? You come down with your kids on Saturday? I come down on, uh, with my kids. It's, uh, it's my church. That's your church. Church is the Saturday farmer's market. Every Saturday, church. it's a ritual. This should be yeah. about the end of the Rainiers and yeah, the, uh, the been beautiful this year, huh? Oh, look how gorgeous they are. I do a nice uh, sauce for duck with it. A chocolate chip? Just using both chairs or just this? Just the Rainier. Just the Rainier? Yeah. You keep that color in the sauce when you make it? Yeah, I, uh, well, I puree some in the sauce and then I add up some pitted one at the end. Ah. Just for the crunch. For the crunch yeah. and the sweetness. Oh, it's delicious. Oh, it's beautiful. Really nice. We got beautiful pastries. What are you uh, What are you getting today? You getting strawberries? I'm getting uh, strawberries from uh, Kathy Unger over there. Uh, they are the strawberries that carry on a little bit further in the season. What's that varietal called? That's a. Uh, uh, you know, to be honest, I don't know the name of the variety. Is that a hood strawberry? No, it's not a hood. It's not a hood. The hood is. Uh, the season is about two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> you know that, right? Two weeks. Right. <laughs> oh, look at they already have uh, blueberries too, huh? Yeah. Wow. Very nice. Oh, it looks to me oh, like, like they're like hiding. They're waiting. Strawberry. Oh, they're hiding them. You have some for me? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <see that? laughs> Wait a minute. Excellent. Look at Do you those. want me to hold them They're back beautiful. here for you? Yeah, if you can just leave them on the side and I'll come pick them up a little bit later on. They yeah. smell great. Oh, they're really nice. Yeah, know? they yeah. smell great. And uh, are you so much for... nicer than California right now. Are you using yeah. those for shortcake? We use them actually for, uh, we have a new pastry chef and he makes a dessert. It's uh, vanilla gratin and uh, he serves it with uh, macerated berries. Now, how really, get... really nice. Wow. Wow. Yeah, pretty tasty, huh? How do you get these to grow for the next... They're an everberry variety. Uh -huh. They produce all summer long. As long as the weather's dry and warm, they keep setting fruit, the plant does. Wow. It's been cool, so we haven't gotten a whole lot out of there. Mm -hmm. But it looks like there's a lot coming on, so wow. August should be... Like September, we should have lots of Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. All right. The flavor's still great. Yeah, they're very nice. Mm. Very, very nice. And you're the only guy in town who gets them. The huh? only guy in town. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're back from the farms in the farmer's market. What's caught my eye in the farmer's market is this humongous clove of elephant garlic. Uh, and, and here I have it again in various forms. I've taken this, this peels like any other garlic does. Comes down, 
uh, but these cloves, and we didn't get to see them yesterday like this, but these, you can see how shiny it is, how the groove is in there. I just peeled these by hand, I didn't even use a knife. That's, that's how easy they were unpeeled. So I look at these and I think puree, and I think slow roast, and I think kind of extrapolating that flavor a little bit more, or as some chefs say, cooking the vegetable to the bones, uh, if you will, all the way down. So I've got these peeled, but they are a little bit sticky, and there can be a risk of a little bit of bitterness to it. So these are actually gonna drop in the water, Kind of boil these just for about two minutes. If there is any bitterness in there, it's just gonna it's gonna pull it out a little bit. Color changes a little bit. It almost becomes a vanilla color, if you will. So here again, I have two ingredients. I'm taking the, these are fresh rosemary springs. Just peeling those off. I'm not chopping them. I'm not bothering with what they look like so much. They're going to be either left in here or omitted. It depends whether you, how strong you want the rosemary. A little bit of salt a little bit of pepper, and a little bit of uh, extra virgin olive oil. And I go a little bit heavier on the olive oil because that becomes one of my main ingredients in here because I'm going to rely on that. Uh, you'll see when we press the garlic and puree it a little bit by hand, that becomes the softening agent. So again, it's salt, it's pepper, it's the garlic cloves that have been poached once. They're not real hard, they're kind of soft, so they won't need to roast too long. And then uh, a little bit of rosemary in there. So any kind of herb could be used, but they're pretty, just as they are. They're just, they're just gorgeous. So not much to do with them. I'm just going to put these in the oven and let them roast slowly. So the garlic has uh, is come out of the oven. It's, it's colored a little bit here. Uh, you can see it's, it's, it's very soft. Uh, the oil is still in there. The remnants of the garlic uh, leaves are in there. So I'm going to transfer this over to a bowl where I can mash it up a little bit. And again, as I mentioned earlier, there's no such thing as really overcooking this. And it can be left kind of coarse. And if you had the fresh garlic or even the aged garlic, it's fine. The reason I'm so attracted to Jeff's elephant garlic is because of the mild flavor. You can just, I mean, literally, you could eat this much of this and you would want more. So it's not overly powerful to the system at all. It's very, very, very mild. And you can see I just I cooked it to a very soft point. It's almost... Uh, it's just turning to a kind of a mush texture like this. So it can use a little bit of, a little more salt. There's a little bit of acidity from the olive oil, so I don't add any vinegar to it. And then it just turns into a paste uh, like this. This is some focaccia bread that I've sliced thin. Any type of bread would work for this. And this becomes just a very simple process at this point of just spreading that garlic on the toast. I've eaten this with a little piece of anchovy on top of it. Maybe it gets a little bit of cheese on top of it. On the other hand, maybe the garlic is simply enough. This is an example of using ingredient from local farms, and we have the roasted garlic and rosemary, the elephant garlic on grilled bread, focaccia or whole wheat bread. So I would just completely be fearless about you know, what happens at the stove and then pay more attention to where it comes from, how it tastes when I pick it in the market, and I think your success is guaranteed at that point. If the farm is a continent away from the table, the food is not fresh. Its taste has been robbed. The good food, the fresh, clean food on your plate. Natural flavors intact, free of pesticide and other poisons. There in all its fullness. A product of the farmer, the chef, and nature herself.